Go on the energy story here and then uh, come at it from uh, what's happening with Russian gas. We can also take a look at China as well. Um, it is day two now of the Nord Stream 1 uh, pipeline shutdown. Germany's economy minister is getting increasingly pessimistic about gas supplies. He says there are no talks between his ministry and Gazprom and they can't count on gas from Nord Stream over the winter. Well, joining us now for more is Katerina Filipenko, Wood McKenzie, principal research analyst. Katerina, good to see you. Does Nord Stream 1 restart on Saturday? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we assume it will restart, but it doesn't mean it will stay on. So we assume that further disruptions are likely, whether via Nord Stream or via uh, other routes, but Russia will try to continue trying to put pressure on uh, on Europe uh, through gas disruptions and also trying to maintain the prices by keeping this uncertainty in the market. Uh, what do you think that does for pricing, Katerina? Um, well, price and uh, prices are extremely volatile, and uh, we see that forward curve is really, really high um, over the winter and uh, into the next uh, summer. Uh, but we do expect that prices will somewhat stabilize um, over the coming summer because um, at the moment prices are also very much driven by the situation in the power market, which we assume will be uh, somewhat more stable into the summer. What I found really confusing, if I just take a look um, at European gas prices, is the lack of movement over the last few days, despite all the headlines and what you said. Like, okay, it might restart, but it's no guarantee. Have we learned to live with this headline now? Is that what the price and the forward curve is telling us? Or is there complacency? To some extent, yeah, the market is kind of getting used to this, but also the price is um, a bit more stable compared to what they were earlier because there were news that Europe actually uh, refilled storage to its targets earlier than expected. So the market seems to be a bit more coming down about uh, the coming winter at least. Um, how much demand destruction have we seen here in Europe uh, particularly as a result of these, these very, very high prices? We have seen uh, quite uh, substantial demand destruction in the industrial sector, and actually we assume that this demand destruction will continue. Over the coming winter, we assume that demand will be about 7% lower than the five-year average, like overall in Europe, um, which is notably less than this 15% uh, demand reduction target that the um, uh, European Commission was talking about. So there's potential for even more. Uh, demand reduction. Is this demand destruction because of the mandate or is this demand destruction because prices are too high and it's like legit demand destruction? Uh, well, it's a, combi it's, it's a combination. Some demand destruction is simply because the prices are too high, um, but uh, some demand destruction is more like in anticipation of, um, of what will come, of what may come this winter and uh, yeah, policy driven. Yeah. I love that legit demand destruction. It's worth making that distinction. <laughs> uh, what's happening in what's, what's happening in making what, what's happening in Asia? Is is there is there legit demand in Asia? How much of China is a factor there? Um, well, China is a big factor, and uh, now there are some new COVID concerns, which potentially can limit the impact um, or the the impact China will have on this demand growth. But also another factor is the storage in Japan, which seems to be um, at a good, uh, comfortable level, which potentially could limit the um, the desire Jap from Japan to buy spot gas, which which is a good news for Europe. Yeah, and I say legit, he's making fun of me, but I'm saying legit demand destruction because high prices means demand destruction, but if you're subsidizing prices or you have price caps, you're not going to get that pure demand destruction that is really the only cure for higher prices. But sure, you can make fun of me. You can channel guy. It's fine. Um, Katerina, to that point, uh, we're waiting next week for energy ministers in Europe to come up with a plan to combat high electricity prices, and one of the plans is to cap prices or to separate the two, natural gas prices uh, with electricity prices. What do you expect? expecting with that and is it a good idea? I mean, um, it's likely that we'll see some news about um, pricing caps, but it's a very difficult balance for um, the energy ministers. If you are imposing a price cap, you need to make sure that this price cap still allows for um, the market signals to come through to the market, right? So that the demand is still responding to high prices. Um, and at the same time, this uh, price needs to be high enough to actually incentivize some additional LNG to come from Asia into Europe. Um, because the uh, um, Europe going through winter relies to a large extent on all this additional LNG coming into Europe. 
uh, there's a lot of debate as well in, in Europe, also here in the UK, uh, around a windfall tax on, on the energy sector. W what is your assessment of the risks of that approach, if there are risks, around investment and around all those obligations, around building out the capex that's needed to diversify this energy mix? Well, um, we definitely see that additional investments is needed, especially as Europe is trying to diversify away of um, Russian gas. Um, and uh, this investment is needed domestically as, as well as outside of Europe. Uh, but within Europe, um, th there should definitely be some consideration about how this wind windfall tax will impact the desire to invest more into gas. But investments are definitely needed. Well, to that point, and just to wrap it up here, um, what is going to be most important for these oil companies? Is it energy security or is it energy transition? And I don't, maybe not just oil companies, but for the countries, which is going to be more important? They're, they're going to have to make a decision in terms of where to put that cash. Yeah. And, uh, well, at the moment, we see in, uh, com companies or countries trying to combine their key goals uh, at sustainability, affordability of energy, and uh, energy security. And um, it, it is a difficult um, one because in the near term, like over the next five uh, years, we definitely need additional gas. So if Europe was to diversify away from Russian gas completely by the end of 2023, they would definitely need additional LNG, additional gas developments until, let's say, 2026, 2027. By but by 2030, the uncertainty becomes really big if Europe is trying to diversify, to uh, decarbonize, let's say, if this repower EU measure is implemented. And then the uncertainty could reach uh, up to 100 BCM of, uh, between this repower EU and the, um, uh, let's say, stable gas demand. And uh, the decision to invest becomes a very tricky one if your 10 years horizon has such a big uncertainty.